Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining for uh, FOSS all the way. Uh, that's if anybody wants a tip to get a talk in for any summit, just try and put the summit name in the title. That typically works for me. So my name is Yogi. Um, a few things that you will realize from this slide is uh, uh, I'm fond of emojis. <laughs> uh, I like to travel. Uh, I've been to all those countries. I'm always exploring uh, ways to get to new countries. And uh, just below that, you'll find all my uh, hobbies. I'm, I'm Indian, so like cricket comes naturally to me. Yeah, I've been living in Singapore for uh, almost two decades now. And uh, currently, I'm a solutions engineer at Yuga by DB. And uh, just in case you didn't realize, uh, it's not YDB. So it's probably like YDB and Yuga by DB. It's a little confusing sometimes, but yeah, we are Yuga by DB. Um, I am working with uh, like our Yuga by DB partners and customers across uh, Asia. So, you know, India, Singapore, Philippines, uh, Indonesia, so on and so forth. And uh, I have been involved in a lot of cloud native uh, communities and also app development. Uh, cloud native platforms in past and now also. Um, the QR code is my contact if you want it. And those are all the places that I have worked in past two decades, I suppose. Uh, why are you here? Like, just in case if you're not sure, this is the topic for talking about Kubernetes, distributed databases, and Kafka, and everything in between. Um, I'm going to have some slideware probably about 150-ish uh, or slides. No, 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 no. It's, uh, I promise it's going to be only 40. Uh, but I'm going to do some live demo. Hopefully, it works. Uh, did not give my sacrifice this morning, so fingers crossed. Um, so a lot of things have happened in last uh, sort of decade uh, in the sense that uh, we went through a massive shift in paradigm. People are moving towards cloud native applications, cloud native platforms. We are talking about Kubernetes, containerization, moving to public cloud, moving back from, from public cloud, moving to microservices, moving back from microservices. It's, it's all happening, right? I mean, uh, it uh, seems very cyclical. And uh, you know, if you were there for the earlier two talks, uh, I think the, the topic is quite well placed uh, because it is what, what I'm going to talk to uh, you about it very well fits into that same story around DevOps and the consistency. So when we talk about anything in technology today, the easiest way to start is if we start with an app, right, which is solving a sort of user problem. And uh, typically, when we say an app, it may mean different things for different people. Uh, if you ask somebody who's born in like last two decades or decade and a half, for them, an app is on their iPhone or uh, Android device, right? Pretty much that's what it is, maybe iPad, right? Um, some people, like I, I'm, from, I'm a kid from 90s, so for 80s or 90s, right? So for me, it's a piece of software, right, or a program. So in all, in essence, I would say an app is a piece of code, right, that is executable. So typically, when you take an app, you need to run it. Now, to run it, what do you do? You take a compute, right? Uh, the compute can come from a virtual machine or a pod. And uh, your application doesn't live alone. It actually has some supporting things. Oh, by the way, one more thing that you might notice about me. I like minions. Uh, it's competition between me and my daughters. Uh, you saw their pictures earlier. So uh, typically, they have their own supporting services that they require. It could be for some sort of networking capability or some sort of uh, organization compliance enforcement kind of practices, right? It happens. It, it is there. And uh, typically, in, uh, in enterprises, an application is never run as a single thing, right? You normally run multiple instances of it. So, so far, so good. Now, in, in the modern applications, in the cloud native world, what we have is a container orchestrator or an infrastructure API provider like Kubernetes, which basically takes care of uh, taking your code, your containerized code, your application, and running it on the actual hardware. 
Uh, it could be on the cloud. It could be running on premises. That that's that's right. But again, I mentioned about all sorts of sidecars and compliance capabilities and all those things. But apart from that, you typically have certain supporting services. You may have messaging systems, you may have database systems, and everything in between, right? Authentication, identity provider, all sorts of things. Um, now, as we move towards a more and more cloud native architecture, we try to move as much as possible to the cloud native platform. Kubernetes, right? When I say cloud native platform, it's for me, it's same as Kubernetes. Now, this is like interesting because you, you obviously we, we talk about the cloud native platform and Kubernetes and all, uh, but typically you have multiple sites and multiple regions, multiple data centers, or it could be cloud regions and things like those, right? So everything that we spoke about so far in your mind, if you're going through, oh, okay, I can I can actually run this command to ex de deploy this, and I can keep a copy of this through this command and blah, blah, blah. Well, all that is doubled now, right? Or tripled in some cases. So something that I always get asked is like, what are you talking, like running database on Kubernetes, are, are you insane or something? Uh, yeah, I am talking about running database on Kubernetes. Why should you actually run database on Kubernetes, right? Now, Kubernetes has actually facilitated uh, better resource utilization. Well, what it does for us well is that uh, it allows you to use your compute, your infrastructure in a more efficient manner. So rather than dedicating your compute for certain applications or certain pieces of code, you can actually treat it more like a kettle. Uh, anybody can tell me what's the difference between a kettle and a pet? Not you. <laughs> so typically for a pet, you have a name, right? It's a uh, goofy or something, right? But for a kettle, like, as a kid, when I was living in India, I, I had like five cows. None of them were my pets. Like I was like, okay, one of the cows. I go milk one of the cows, right? I don't know which one, but just go milk it. So that, that's the difference. You do not actually have a, a direct attachment or like sort of a, a naming or strict dependency on a kettle mindset. So that's what Kubernetes is actually providing for us. It's, it provides you with the capability to run variety of applications in a very standardized manner. And not just running the application, but also connecting it to the underlying infrastructure. It could be network, it could be storage, it could be identity provider, many things, right? So this actually allows you to make use of the compute for running multiple databases. Today, uh, if you've worked, I'm, I'm sure all of you have worked in some enterprise at some point in your career. And uh, if you request for a new database, what's the fastest you've gotten it? If it's not on Kubernetes or uh, it's not on cloud, what's the not cl cloud? That that's cheating. Let's let's talk about something that that is more traditional. I have a giveaway, by the way. Every time somebody says something, you you will get a give giveaway. What's three? Three months? That's fast. Okay, well, the thing is that uh, uh, I, I have seen like even longer than that, but when it comes to Kubernetes, you can pretty much spin up databases very quickly. And hopefully if I have enough time, I'll probably try and spin up one for you in front of you. So that is one. The second is uh, dynamic sort of resizing. You're able to resize your workload based on your need. The demand is higher, you can have more. If demand is lower, you can reduce it, make it smaller, and things like those. Um, you have an extremely good amount of portability between clouds and on-prem and all that if you run things on Kubernetes. I'm going to go a little faster because I was, uh, there, there was an issue with the timing, I suppose. Um, and uh, more importantly, it provides you with a very good orchestration for your entire infrastructure. So not just... Uh, um, you know, running your application, but, you know, con connecting to a variety of storage and all. And, of course, it allows you to automate a lot of day-to-work. What is day-to-work? 
backup, recovery, restoration, upgrades, all those is day two work. But anything that has benefits has some downside, right? So these are some of the downsides. When you are actually running things on Kubernetes, you have to be a little aware about stateful nature of your workload because your, your application run and your data may not actually end up on the same node. So that's, that's a bit of a uh, problem. Uh, you can address those through distributed database. Um, persistent storage, especially in case of, cases of databases, persistent storage is always a problem. But that can also be something that can be addressed through a distributed database. Um, another complexity is uh, with the reliable access. So you need to have a load balancing to your application, to your database, um, even inside Kubernetes. So obviously, if you run it on cloud, you have cloud-based options. If you run it on-premises, you have to solve for it. Um, there is also a big networking complexity, especially when you have multiple clusters. So if you have two Kubernetes clusters running in two different data centers, networking between them is going to be quite challenging, right? So you, that is something that you have to be aware of. Within the cluster, if your application and the, the database is running on the same uh, cluster, it's pretty, pretty, pretty good, pretty easy. So essentially what I'm saying is, don't run database on Kubernetes, run a distributed SQL database on. And that is that is what exactly a Yugabyte is. Yugabyte is a distributed open source transaction oriented database, which is 100% open source. So, and it's it's pronounced as Yugabyte. Um, a lot of uh, gotchas or the limitations that I mentioned earlier can actually be resolved by Yugabyte in terms of uh, it eliminates some of the need for external load balancers, also, it automates a lot of your day two work that you might be running into. Plus, it gives you the scalability. You, you have more traffic coming in, you can actually in, uh, increase the number of nodes. And if your tra traffic has tapered out, you can decrease the number of nodes. You can read and write on all the nodes. Let me just repeat. You can read and write on all the nodes in Yugabyte DB, which is a stark contrast to the traditional RDBMSs without compromising the asset transactions. You are able to actually perform the transactional applications that you are, you are used to uh, with RDBMS capabilities, tables, and everything, and transactions. Um, a small footprint of Yugabyte would look something like this. You typically have a small management console, which basically provides you with the management capabilities. And uh, you have database nodes, typically minimum three, because it's a distribution. So three, five, seven, those are all good numbers, but minimum three is, is needed. Now what it provides, what we have created is the distributed transaction and storage layer, which provides you with automatic sharding and load balancing. And on top of that, a pluggable query layer that provides you with RDBMS capabilities uh, akin to Postgres and no SQL capabilities, which are uh, akin to Cassandra. So in a single cluster, you are able to perform both kind of data models with Yugabyte DB. Now, what does a deployment of Yugabyte looks like on Kubernetes? We use stateful set. If you're not familiar with the Kubernetes, stateful set is a construct in Kubernetes to run stateful applications. So the ordering of pods and all is taken care of automatically by Kubernetes. So we use that, those. We have two sets of pod. One is the master, which is more of a metadata server. Master is a very bad name, because the moment you say master, people go, oh, there is master, so you will copy over. No, it's metadata server. And the T server, which is the tablet server, the name originates from our sharding name, our shards. Every table that we create, we split it into shards. Each shard is called a tablet. That's why tablet server. And you are able to horizontally or vertically scale each of these components. Now, I mentioned earlier, uh, every time we create a table, it gets uh, split into shards called tablets. And these tablets are something that are distributed across multiple nodes. And um, all the data that you are storing will actually go synchronously, not asynchronously, but synchronously to all the nodes. So let me try and show you a very quick demo. And I probably would have to sit for this. Any questions so far? How much time do I have? 10 minutes? Okay, good.
Yes. Um, I am not sure about YDB. Uh, one thing I remember from uh, my understanding of YDB was uh, it's based on MySQL API, and we are based on Postgres SQL. And uh, I mean, in, in terms of uh, replication capabilities, uh, we do synchronous replication of data and asynchronous, like if you are doing it across sites, across clusters. So we can do that. Uh, collect your giveaway later. It's here. All right. Um, so let us look at a database that I have running here. So first of all, I mentioned that Yugabyte is uh, Can everybody see the screen? Is it legible? Okay, so I mentioned that we actually run pods as and stateful sets. So this is my database that is running on uh, uh, Kubernetes. And you can see I have uh, master and T server as my uh, um, stateful sets and then a bunch of pods which are running here. So this is similar to the architecture diagram that I showed you earlier. Now over here, uh, what I can do is I can actually run a sample application that will, this, this is a simple sample application which basically keeps on inserting data into the database. It's a workload generator application. So we'll do that. Now this is like pretty much simple, right? Bread and butter, like this is, this is okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually take down one of the nodes of my database and this application should continue to work without any issues. Yeah. So for that, what I will do is I, it's, it's tough to actually cause a failure in Kubernetes. So uh, my trick, trick is typically I reduce the number of uh, replicas to two. Like right now I have three replicas. I will reduce it to two and let's see what happens. Okay. So I, I reduce it to two. Now something interesting happened. So one of the, one of the in-flight transaction, right, which was connecting to that particular node that went down, it got disconnected. But rest of the system, it just continued to function. Now, there is a delay of about three seconds between the cluster rebalancing itself due to the node failure. So it took, if you see carefully here, it took three seconds for it to just come back to a stable state where it's able to uh, look at each other. And uh, we obviously have a small UI to go along with it. And by the way, this is all open source. I'm not using the um, enterprise version or anything. I'm just using the open source version. Um, this is actually showing you the three master nodes. And this is showing you the three tablet servers that we have. Uh, the one that I have reduced, it, it is starting to miss the heartbeats now because it's down, right? Uh, it will wait for this server to come back for about 15 minutes by default. Uh, if it doesn't come back in about 15 minutes, what it will think of is it will declare it as dead and any new server that comes up would be bootstrapped for data. But in the meantime, my application that I was running, it just continues to run, no problem, without any, any downtime. Um, I am going to scale this back and what I should see here is... Uh, Interestingly, some of some of the uh, tablets here, there, there are no leaders on this particular node while it was away, right? Because, I mean, it is not capable of serving any data. What will happen is automatically within few seconds, it will rebalance itself and the leadership role will be restored on the, uh, for some of the tablets, for some of, some of the shards. Uh, that's, that's the thing with live demos, they can, it can take a while, but yeah, there, there you see, automatically earlier this number was zero, five slash zero. Now it's five slash one and it might get rebalanced to maybe five slash two also. So this is how Yugabyte DB, because of being a distributed SQL database, is able to run in a, a cloud native environment like Kubernetes and sustain failures and it can also provide you with the transaction guarantees, the asset transactions. Um, 
So, that is that, let me see. Yeah, we, we saw this particular thing. Um, yeah, just in case if it was not clear, this is uh, like typically, let, let's say if you have four pods which are uh, running, um, a table is automatically split into all these shards and shards are scattered across all these pods. The number of copies of the shard depends on the replication factor that you are defining at the beginning of the cluster. And one of the shard will become the leader for the shard group. So this is how it happens. So all the reads and writes would be uh, would be done for the, by the blue tablets, which are basically the leader tablets. Um, all the selection and everything is automated. Now, I mean, obviously, if you want to try it out, we have a completely 100% open source version. We have Docker container. We are able to even run on uh, ARM machines and all. In fact, uh, on AWS, we are the only certified uh, distributed database for Graviton. So if that is something that you want to try, you can try that as well. Uh, we obviously have our enterprise offering as, uh, you know, you go by DB Anywhere, which provides you with a nice portal for day two operation, multi-cluster management uh, capabilities and all. And we have a fully managed cloud offering, which you can leverage for your projects. Um, you can actually sign, sign up for a free cluster today. You can actually get a free cluster for life. Just try it out. And... Uh, you can actually arrange for a full-blown demo and not like a small three-minute demo. Uh, just scan the QR code and uh, fill the form and you get $10 grab voucher. Any questions? Okay. I'll leave it on that and happy to take questions now. Sure. Yes, you can use it on bare metal. We actually make it very easy for you. We have a tool called Ubyte Voyager, completely free open source, that you can use for migrating over from MySQL and Postgres and Oracle. Yes. Third question. <laughs> Okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. You will need to refactor your application and there'll be an ETL that would have to happen. Yeah, good questions. Other questions? Yes. Uh, you first. Yes, if you have an application that is currently using Postgres, it should just work. In fact, you can use the same Postgres driver. We have a smart driver because we are a cluster, right? So like any other clustered uh, database, there is, a, there is a concept around it. But uh, you can still use Postgres uh, uh, driver also to connect. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Correct. So, yes, we, we have not solved that problem, right? I mean, the latency, the physics is physics, right? Speed of light is speed of light. But the thing is that uh, in, in case of like asymmetric latency, say, for example, three nodes, one is five seconds, five milliseconds away, the other is 10 milliseconds away, then you will effectively be waiting for five milliseconds because we wait for majority of the cluster to get the data. So, there is that optimization. But yes, we are not immune to underlying network latency. We, it, it will become part of your transaction. Yes. Good questions. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, good. Uh, we, uh, our Helm chart is most advanced, I would say, but we are working on an operator as well. We, we have an operator, but it's not as advanced. Yes, yes. Yes, so it, it, I, I, I can give you, like this is a published study on uh, Yugabyte uh, website uh, with Teminos, which is a core banking vendor. So they have actually managed to get 
about 450 queries, uh, 450,000 queries per second across 39 nodes in three availability zones on AWS. It's their uh, benchmark test, and they said it's about 40% better than what they had. Yes. Your per transaction latency, your per transaction latency would be higher because of the synchronous replication. Yeah, I mean, we, what, we have, what we have observed is uh, uh, ideally we can uh, bring it down to about 3x of a Postgres database, right? But uh, we, we've even seen like, you know, because of the synchronous replication, um, yeah, because the database, database itself, the writes on the database are not uh, that, uh, I mean, th there's no latency as such. We suffer from the latency on the under underlying network. If the underlying network has like, you know, uh, below millisecond kind of latency, which is like local, then you, do, you should not, you should see like at the most about 3x in terms of a transaction. But of course, we, we compensate it uh, with throughput. Yeah, I mean, ha happy to discuss the use case really, um, because we, we have seen we have seen uh, uh, various use cases where uh, we have been able to actually provide better throughput. Because one of the issues with Postgres you will find is because of a single node master. Um, the number of connections, simultaneous connections that you can do to that node is limited. So you will be limited by that number, but go horizontally and at least increase the number of connections. Yes. Yeah. There's no exclusive lock. We are a lock free database. First of all, uh, second thing is, uh, if your query commit has finished the data, has resiliently stored across the customer. Like right very next instance, like your commit happened on, and obviously at the hood we are using SS tables and mem tables, right? And we have a wall log. So it works as it goes in the wall log, if the node crashed and if it comes back again, it will reprocess from the wall log, right? If it has not gone through. Uh, but the point is that if the commit has happened and the control has gone back to the client, then that has resiliently been stored. Some other shard which will take up the leadership role will now have your latest commit. So, in fact, I did not mention it in the presentation. We, we, we practically have a zero RPO, like absolutely no data loss in, in face of a failure. If your, if your transaction is committed, it, the data will not be. An RPO is about three seconds minimum. No, that's for the portal. Yeah, uh, the the configuration of the database obviously would. I mean, that was a minimal configuration, I would say. But uh, depending on the number of uh, depending on the number of uh, transactions that you're looking for, the amount of workload and all, configuration would be bigger. Any more questions? I still have uh, three more things to give away. Please. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. You do not, the application doesn't have to worry about which server do I connect to and no, none of that. That, I mean, uh, being an app developer like that, that for me is a big, big boon, you know, like not having to bother about which server to connect, which cluster to write to and all that, none of it. Just connect to any one of the nodes, write the data there, and it, it will be there. Okay, uh, are we out of time? Okay, um, I would say let's thank the speaker here. We have a lot of time.